Hey guys, Yulia here. So today I'm doing another uh, plant haul video and this time it's all native plants. And by native plants, I mean plants that are native to my area, which is northern New Jersey. Now there is a huge overlap in uh, native plants. They could be native to the entire United States or maybe just the east coast of United States or maybe just the mid-Atlantic states, which New Jersey is part of or maybe just a small part of the United States. So when you are looking for a native plant to your area, you can uh, usually look up in the map online to see where this plant is native to and make your selection that way. But I am just going to jump right into the plants and start talking about this first plant that I have here that I absolutely adore and I think it deserves much more recognition in gardens, whether native or not. Um, this plant is a Vernonia iron butterfly or ironweed, and it is absolutely beautiful. Um, this gorgeous fine texture that is always looks good. It doesn't get any mildew or any sort of diseases, even in our area, which is very humid during the summer. And then in the fall, starting in September, it gets these beautiful flowers. And um, I've had one plant for about six or seven years, and they are slow to establish, but then eventually grow in a very large patch. And I saw a more mature specimen in our local uh, garden, one of our local gardens, and I was blown away how gorgeous it was. It was covered in bees. Um, now this is a huge pollinator plant. Uh, bees love it, butterflies love it. And again, always looks good. The only thing I would say that these plants are kind of hard to divide. If you decide to get this plant out of the ground and make divisions, a lot of native plants have a very huge root system and that actually helps them to be a little bit more drought tolerant. Now, um, the fact that, you know, a lot of people say that natives are maintenance free, it's a little bit of a misnomer. You know, they can have their own issues, but because they have that larger root system, they can be less maintenance. So more drought tolerant, you know, no fertilizer needed but I just absolutely adore this plant. It has this beautiful green foliage all the time, like the saturated foliage. There's another plant that I have in my garden that is very similar to this one, and I actually sometimes confuse the two. The, the other one is Amsonia hubrichtii, and it does have that beautiful texture uh, with the needle-like leaves but the color of the leaves is a little bit more faded, especially when it comes fall. And that is actually another beautiful plant that you should be growing in your garden. It has um, really light pale blue flowers in the spring and then beautiful texture during the summer and then amazing fall color in the fall. So this is actually a cultivar and it was bred to be a little bit shorter because um, a lot of times iron weeds get really tall and kind of splay open. So this one is very well behaved, just a wonderful plant, um, doesn't flop. The flowers provide the same pollination uh, or pollinator quality as the original plant, Vernonia. So I absolutely recommend that you guys find this plant, whether in a plug or maybe a smaller plant and include it in your garden, whether it be native garden or just a regular one. So the next plant I have here is this beautiful little blue stem. And little blue stem is one of my most favorite grasses to use in landscapes. It's just like nothing else. It has this beautiful uh, blue foliage and then in the fall it changes to purple color which is i don't think like any other grass does that uh, so beautifully well there is a big blue stem that is the big brother to the little blue stem and it kind of does the same thing 
but the little blue stem has this beautiful texture and I use it in um, landscapes a lot because it's just so low maintenance. But there's one thing about this grass. It will do great in a very hot, sunny locations with poor soil. If it is planted in a little bit more shade or if soil is a little bit more fertile, it starts to flop. So if you have a, a space where like nothing will grow, the soil is really bad, it is really hot, plant some little blue stem, they will love it there. And another thing is its root system. So as I mentioned with the ironweed, the root system of native plants is very large. And with the grasses, it, it can actually be five times to 10 times larger than what you see above ground. And that is just incredible. And that also makes them a really good erosion control and slope control plants. So if you have that slopey side of your uh, garden or your house where it's really hot, you have poor soil, just plant some native grasses. They will definitely hold that soil together. But uh, this uh, size is about how tall they get. They get maybe like a little bit taller. This is a young plant that I just got in the nursery. But um, there are different cultivars. This one is a straight species, but there are different cultivars of little blue stems. Some are just more straight. Some are a little bit smaller, but they all provide that uh, wonderful texture in the garden. If I had, let's say five acres of land where I lived, three acres of it would be little blue stem. Like that's how much I love this plant. But if you are not into that, you know, meadow prairie kind of look, um, you can definitely incorporate this plant with a larger flowers like the hydrangeas or dahlias. They look really well together. Um, so definitely, definitely try this grass. The next plant I have here is this New York Aster Woods Purple. And as you probably notice, is aster season and they are pretty much everywhere. But they look uh, more like this little moundy, uh, almost like moms, because they prune them um, over and over again during the summertime. So they get that really tight look and a lot of flowers. I actually prefer my asters to be a little bit looser like this. But the ones that you see in the store are probably some sort of derivative of um, native asters. And there are a number of native asters to our area, like the New York aster or New England aster. There is the white wood asters that I have in my garden. Uh, there's aromatic asters. Um, there are so many asters. In fact, Aster family is one of the biggest plant families in the world. I believe there's like 23,000 species in aster family. Um, and I do confuse them because I'm not like a horticulturalist or a botanist. So my aster game is not really strong, but you know, I could probably tell aromatic aster from New England or New York aster. Anyway, going back to this plant, absolutely beautiful like I don't have to tell you to get native plants when they look like this it is just a spectacular plant beautiful purple flowers pretty much will go anywhere in the garden they do like sunny locations uh, they pair up really well with any other ornamental plants um, so this particular uh, cultivar which is woods purple was actually bred um, to be more disease resistant. And I completely understand because I have other asters in my garden and they have mildew for most of the year. And I think at some point I may even pull them out because they just don't look that good. And um, if you're breeding for uh, more of a disease resistant, I think that's definitely a valid point. But this plant is just absolutely beautiful. It is um, about two feet tall and two feet wide. This is what you see is what you get. They do um, 
sometimes flop. So if you are worried about your asters flopping, you can do a Chelsea chop, which is pretty much cutting your plant in half um, in spring. I usually do it around May time. You can cut it either in half or maybe one third. So they're a little bit more sturdy. But other than that, no issues whatsoever. Really huge pollinator plant, beautiful, gorgeous blooms uh, in fall time where a lot of plants are kind of done. So definitely try it. All right, so the next plant here is this Rudbeckia maxima or a large coneflower. And uh, there is no flower because it faded, but I really love these seed heads right here. Um, and the flowers are actually yellow, which are not my favorite. Um, but Michael really likes yellow flowers and this plant is going to go into the front bed, which is our designated bed for warm colors. But I really love this plant for its foliage. I mean, it's like nothing I've seen before in um, native plants or like ornamentals. It has these beautiful, big, almost like cabbage-like leaves. And then it has this big stalk with the flower that can grow up to six feet tall. So you have this um, collection of leaves and then you have these beautiful flowers. It doesn't look like much right now, although I still love the look as is. Um, but if you Google Rebecca Maxima, a lot of the photographs that you will see is this plant planted in the mass and it looks stunning just absolutely stunning and so unusual. Um, and I just can't wait to see how this plant performs because this is the first time I'm growing this. I'm just uh, going to grow one for about a year. And if it performs really well, I will get about you know four or five more to have that look. Um, but from everything I read, it's not fussy, uh, really tolerates all sorts of soils, uh, likes full sun. So in fact, like a lot of uh, plants with leaves that have that little powdery blue sheen on them, prefer full sun. Um, but it's definitely going into the front bed and I can't wait to see how it does. All right, so the next plant I have here is the switchgrass totem pole. And when I saw it in a nursery, I'm going to put it down because it's huge. Um, when I saw it in the nursery, I was in love. I love me a big grass. And this has everything <laughs> in it. It has the size, the beautiful blue leaves, um, gorgeous panicles of seed heads, it is a very strong looking plant. Um, so I actually have a couple of switchgrasses in my garden. One is Shenandoah, another one is Prairie Fire. And I love them, but they tend to um, be a little bit weaker, maybe a flop sometimes. The Shenandoah, not as much as the Prairie Fire, but this plant seems to be really strong and that's what you're looking for in a good grass. Um, this grass is, you know, from the nursery, so it is probably on a smaller side right now. I think it's going to get like five and a half feet, maybe six feet tall, which I can't wait to see you guys. So switch grasses are amazing grasses. That's another type of grass if I had a lot of land I would probably do swaths of because grasses are those plants um, that provide a lot of movement in the garden there's not a lot of plants that do that you know we do love our hydrangeas and roses and annuals uh, you know petunias and other plants but grasses way in the wind they have this beautiful airy texture that looks amazing with uh, when the sun is um, lit from this side I love it and in addition a lot of the grasses native or not are deer resistant and it is a huge <laughs> huge 
bonus where I am because we do have deer in our area. I know it seems a very like busy and almost urban, but we um, get a lot of deer during spring and early summer. Like by late summer, they're kind of busy, you know, somewhere else. But we do get a lot of deer in our front yard and in my garden on the side of the house. So I have to spray for deer and a lot of times I would resort to planting grasses because they do not like those. But this guy is going on the devil strip. I cannot wait to see how it plays with others. I cannot wait to see how it does during the winter because winter interest is uh, very important to me and uh, to see how it withstands the winds, the elements, the snow. But I think it's going to do really well. I am so excited to have this in my garden. Um, switch grasses are huge um, plants for birds. They both eat the seeds and they also um, have like shelter quality for the birds. So anyway, super, super happy with this one. So the next plant or plants that I have here are these uh, Eucharist green spice. And Eucharist are uh, one of those plants that are truly American and they come from North America. And all of the cultivars that you see on the market right now are derived from American species of Eucharist. And this particular cultivar right here is, um, the parent is Eucharist Americana. And I have seen the straight species and actually planted them and they look very similar to this foliage right here. Not as bright or as colorful, but very, very similar to this. I absolutely adore this plant. It is um, subtle, you know, not like the purple ones or the caramels that we see out there and like really bright ones, although I love those too. But sometimes, you know, it's kind of, good to go back to your roots so to speak no pun intended and have a good all more like a greener looking euchre and this one is the foliage is just stunning the marble like leaves um, i also find that this variety is a little bit easier to grow now euchres are not easy plants they are promoted as easy but they're they're a little tricky um, because they kind of need moist soil but well drained. They will grow in the shade but will need a little bit more sun to color up. So you have to find kind of like the right sweet spot for them in the garden. Also, a lot of the Eucharist have those stalks, you know, the ones that they start growing and the foliage falls off and they have those stalks and they start, stop looking uh, um, uh, pretty attractive. They kind of like leggy. Um, this is more of a clumping variety, which I love. So um, I do have a woodland garden area in my garden. I know the Eucharist like a little bit more of a humusy soil. So I will be adding a lots of compost for these ones. Now, a lot of other Eucharists or also called coral bells have these beautiful stalks of flowers with little coral bells. This particular variety blooms with white flowers. And the last plant that I have for today is this Echinacea purpurea white swan. And you probably are familiar with the straight species uh, of Echinacea or coneflower, which um, are usually pink flowers. This one has white flowers, but um, in the trials where they observed um, sort of a pollinator plant quality between this plant and the original species, they found no difference, which makes this plant different from the original species, but also very valuable to pollinators, which is a win-win. But I love echinaceas. I have the straight species. I have a different species of echinacea in my garden that I started from seeds this spring. And uh, this particular one, I actually have never grown before. I planted it in other people's gardens and they have done so well. Um, and it is unusual for echinaceas because echinaceas are short-lived perennials. So if you are not 
having good uh, luck with echinaceas, it is not you, <laughs> it is the echinaceas because they're just short-lived. They uh, grow, they bloom, they set seeds and then they seed and then the seedlings usually perform the next year or the following year. But I just love this variety um, with the beautiful white flowers and those uh, gorgeous cones. And when the petals fall off, the cones stay way, way into the depth of winter. And they're very attractive to birds, especially goldfinches. And I see goldfinches on my echinacea all the time. And I don't really see them around here. I think the only reason they come here is because of this and some of the grasses that I have. But echinaceas are very easy to grow. They're very drought tolerant. They're not fussy about the soil. They also can be grown in full sun, part sun and part shade locations, which is not a lot of uh, plants or perennials are adaptable that way. And I have grown my echinaceas in all different environments in my garden and they've been so easy. You can deadhead them uh, during the summer after they're done with their first flush of blooms. They will bloom for you again in September. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this plant haul. I hope you will try some of the native species or cultivars that are very close to native species in your own garden because I think as gardeners, we underestimate how much difference we can make in the world of pollinators and birds. We all love, love birds and critters, right? <laughs> so um, thank you so much for watching this video, you guys. Um, and I will see you in the next one.